Well, hello, New Hope. Glad you're able to join us via video and uh, some today. Our task is to discuss and talk about and minister on the subject, the Battle of Armageddon. We call it a campaign because there are multiple players who will be destroyed in this series of battles. It's not just one battle. There's battles in Egypt, Syria, Arabia, and Israel itself, culminating in the great battle that we call Armageddon in the Valley of Jehoshaphat in Jerusalem. We will be sharing a lot of scripture, so please have your Bible at the ready. We will be reading many pertinent passages. I would hope that this series on end times will pique your interest and turn every one of you into a serious Bible student. Let's begin by reading from a couple of passages from the Gospels, which will show us Jesus' perspective on this coming war to end all wars. So we begin our reading tonight from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24. We'll be reading verses 27 to 31. As the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. This is not the rapture of the church. This is the second coming of Christ to the earth. He will physically return to the earth with his saints, with the church, and he will return to the earth and set foot on the Mount of Olives. We will read about that in just a bit. For wherever the carcass is, verse 28 continues, there will the eagles be gathered together. The King James uses an old word, eagles, uh, can be birds of carrion. They can, they can uh, uh, eat previously killed animals and so forth, and they do. But the proper rendering here is vultures. So wherever the vultures are gathered together, that, that's where the carcasses are going to be. This is talking about this great battle, this great campaign of Armageddon. Verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven and then shall all of the tribes of the earth mourn. This is talking about the 12 tribes of Israel who have been scattered all over the world. And they will mourn because they shall look upon him whom they pierced, Zechariah says. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect. Again, this is Israel. From the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So imagine a war, imagine a campaign with me that is justified, one that is righteous, one that uh, only is meant to reclaim the, the land that is rightfully God's. And imagine this just war. And this is what we'll be talking about tonight when Jesus returns with his church. We're not talking about the rapture. That's when Jesus comes for his church and they will go with him back to heaven for seven years. But we are talking about the return of Christ to the earth with his church and destruction to countless multitudes who will meet in battle, doing all they can to keep the Lord from returning and setting up his kingdom and ruling as king of all kings and lord of all lords. We have three primary points tonight that we want to talk about. First of all is the purpose of Armageddon. Second will be the parables and patterns that picture the timing of the a great separation. And then finally, the third is the participants living and those that are slaughtered during this horrendous period of time. So we consider the subject, the Battle of Armageddon. 
The word Armageddon appears only once in our English Bibles, and it's found in Revelation 16, 16. Almost all commentaries that you read and Bible dictionaries render the interpretation of this Hebrew word as Har Megiddo, which in Hebrew is the mountain of Megiddo. I have been there. I have been to this great valley, and I have imagined in this great valley uh, armies billeted together there. I've seen tents in my mind, in my imagination, as the battle plan is set in array, and companies after companies, and nations after nations in this great, great valley called uh, Armageddon, or in Israel it's called the Valley of Jezreel. Revelation 16, verses 15 and 16 says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. The idea here is, again, he's coming back as a thief to those who are not watching. But he, for you and I as the church, watching and waiting for the coming of the Lord, He's not coming back as a thief. We are children of the light. We know the signs. We know he will return in due time. But he's coming as a thief to the world. And there will be some who will watch during this tribulation period. And so he gathered them together in a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. I ran across this little tidbit. I just would like to... Uh, toss this out. I believe it's due some merit. Armageddon is not actually a single Hebrew word. In fact, it's a conjunction, perhaps, of, of three words. And those three words all indicate a repeating theme. And the repeating theme is one of judgment, it's one of end time harvest, and it's one of a... a uh, Battle in a treacherous, deep, uh, rugged valley. So in the Hebrew, a sheaf of grain, standing grain, is called Amir. And a steep, treacherous valley is called Gahi. There are two Hebrew words for valley. And Gahi is one of them. And it's a steep, treacherous valley. Lo, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, it's a steep, treacherous place. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. That's the Hebrew word. And then the final is the word Dan or Don. Dan was one of the tribes of Israel, one of the original 12. And his name means to judge or to be judged. So if you, com if you combine the three of these, you have a sheaf of grain which is in time harvest in a steep, treacherous valley uh, and judgment there, judgment of the nations. You combine the three of those together and you get the word Aramagidon, which is very close to Armageddon. Don't take it to the bank, but it's just something to ponder. I would like to say that there are virtually zero people who have never heard the word Armageddon. It's, it's commonly used all the time. People use the word Armageddon on a casual basis, usually about some catastrophic volcanic eruption or an earthquake or tsunami or even a le local weather event of some sort. Hollywood's made movies with the title Armageddon. I remember a movie uh, about a crew of people flying a, a space shuttle up to a meteor that would destroy the earth. But tonight, as we ponder this subject, we're going to see that Armageddon, as perceived by the general public and as perceived by Hollywood, will not even come close to the account that we'll read about in your Bible. I think that we, too, as the church, have many misconceptions about these events. Segments of the church today are just as ignorant as the world in that regard. Vast segments of the church don't even believe that there's going to be an Armageddon. But 
Get ready, it's coming. And so we begin. But before an Armageddon battle can take place or campaign can take place, there are a few things that need to occur. The most important, a huge missing piece, is the second coming of Christ to the earth. There can be no Armageddon unless Jesus returns. This morning we need to consider he is not coming as a lamb, but he's coming as a lion. When he returns to the earth, he will not be gentle. When he returns to the earth, he's coming to rid the earth of all rebellion. There will be no grace. He will not be a loving savior. He will not be a forgiving savior. It's his intent to purge the earth of all sin and rebellion and set up his kingdom here. He's coming back to the earth, again, not as a lamb, but as a lion, full of rage and hatred for the sin that has beset this planet. But you say, rightly, it's not God's nature to hate. Absolutely true. That's true today. Perhaps tomorrow, all the way down to the rapture of the church, whenever that takes place. But on judgment day for multitudes at Armageddon, if you are unrepentant and lost and living in open rebellion against God, if you are a combatant, your only purpose or involvement is to kill Jesus and his heavenly army when and where they return to the earth. You'll be treated as an enemy combatant. And when Jesus returns to the earth, it will be with rage on the godless. Rage upon those who live in open rebellion against God. Rage upon those who have rejected God's only son. And therefore, they've rejected the only path that there is to righteousness and relationship with God. Armageddon. Armageddon is coming. And the following passage in Revelation uses a picture of a harvest in the ancient world. It's a metaphor. Grain is cut at harvest time with a sharp sickle. And just like fallen grain stalks, the earth is harvested by cutting down the living souls to be slaughtered at Armageddon. Armageddon also pictures the harvest of grapes from the earth. The living are crushed under the great weight of the millstone of God's wrath. And just like the grape juices running out from the bottom of these wine presses, so blood will flow from the wrath of Almighty God in his wine press of wrath. In Revelation chapter 14, verses 14 to 20, we see the second coming of Christ. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud And upon the cloud, one set like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice, saying to him that was on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time is come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle uh, on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and he cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, thrust in thy sharp sickle. Gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and he gathered the vine of the earth, and he cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city. Now we're bringing Jerusalem into it. And blood came out of the winepress even unto the horse's bridles. 
by the space of 1,600 furlongs. We're talking about a serious battle scene where the blood from the carnage will reach the depth of the, the bridles on a horse. And 1,600 furlongs, some Bibles say 185 miles. Others say it could be as much as 200 miles. We cannot imagine the carnage. We cannot imagine the depth of the slaughter that will occur at this great battle site. It's going to take months to bury the dead, we are told by the prophet Ezekiel. Seven months in just burying the dead, doing the first, the first uh, uh, series of burials. We see also the second coming of Christ in Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 to 21. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. In chapter 6, we saw a rider on a white horse, but that rider was, was a fake. That rider was, was an also Christ or an antichrist. He is not the true faithful Christ that we see here in Revelation 19. And he's riding on a white horse. And in righteousness, does he judge and make war? Again, imagine a war that is righteous and just. Imagine a war that is truthfully fought. Imagine a war where, where all rebellion is removed from the earth. Instead of just making people angrier and the hate levels to grow, we have, we have in love the earth being reaped and the earth being judged. It goes on and describes this individual who sat on the horse. And we'll read the balance of this talking about the armies that also sat on horses. There are people, there are scoffers who scoff at the idea of Jesus returning on a white steed on a horse. There are those that scoff, and I don't, I don't understand everything I know about what this might look like, but what I can tell you is this. We really don't know what's going to happen in the future. We do not know if events are going to take place that will thrust our society back into the, the dark ages and beyond. We do not know. Years ago, as a young man, I began to study what's called electromagnetic pulses, EMPs. And one nuclear weapon detonated just a couple of hundred miles above the continental United States would take out our entire electrical grid. We would be blind. We would have no electricity, we would have no uh, refrigeration, we'd have no deliveries, we'd have no water, we'd have no food. We would be sent back into the dark ages and within days, thousands of people would begin to die. The possibility is there. And we first heard about this in the 1800s where there was a great solar flare that took out the internet system at that time. It was the telegraph system. And it took down telegraph lines all across the continental United States. And people wrote about it, which we're able to go back now and put the pieces together. A nuclear weapon will do the same thing. It's like a great solar flare that will take out our electrical grid. It will burn up our transformers. It will take years for those transformers to, to be built and then replaced and to bring the grid back up online. So I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. In righteousness does he judge? and make war. His eyes are as a flaming fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, indicating that there, this war is going to be a bloody war, just like we read in chapter 14 
of the book of Revelation. It's going to be a bloody war. And his cloak, his vestures dipped in blood. And his name is called the word of God. We know this to be Jesus the Christ. And the armies which were in heaven, including you and me, followed him on white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his sharp goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. He had on his vesture and on his thigh a, a name written. This is the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that set on them, and the flesh of men, free and bond, small and great. And I saw the beast, the Antichrist, and the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him, against the king of all kings. This one that sat on the horse, and against his army, and the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had the mark of the beast and them that worshiped his image. Check out Pastor Weaver's uh, tremendous message on the mark of the beast uh, this Sunday morning. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain. And with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth. And all the fowls were filled with their flesh. There are two suppers. There's the marriage supper of the lamb, which will be eaten with Christ in heaven by every participant, everyone who, who from the smallest to the greatest in the church and in the kingdom of God. We're going to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom. And we're going to fellowship with them. And we're going to break bread with them. We're going to eat with them. The marriage supper of the Lamb. It's going to take place. It's going to be a mighty, mighty uh, time together. A time of fellowship and love and worship as we love Jesus. And as we get to, to sit with him and feast with him. But there's also the supper of the great God. Ezekiel saw it. And so many other Old Testament prophets saw it. And it's described in this very same way where the vultures and the animals that, that, uh, that eat carrion are all come together into this valley and they eat the flesh of captains and kings and, and mighty men and so forth, just like we read. One more portion of scripture I'd like to read is from Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah describes the events that take place. Again, we can have no Armageddon without Jesus returning to the earth. And in chapter 14 of Zechariah, we have the return of Christ to the earth. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and the spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. God says, I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. And then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. That may be a reference to when Pharaoh's armies were drowned in the Red Sea and God fought for them. Israel was not able to protect themselves, but they were protected by God. And the armies of, of the then Antichrist, uh, the model of the then Antichrist, the Pharaoh of Egypt, and all of his armies 
were drowned in the Red Sea. And his feet, verse 4 says, shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. That In that day is, is used 16 times in these few chapters of Zechariah. All of this takes place in a very short period of time. All of this takes place in one long day, as we shall see. And so the feet of Jesus will stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. You remember from Acts chapter 1, the two angels that appeared to the disciples when they saw Jesus ascend into heaven. They said, this same Jesus is going to return again exactly like he left. And I believe it will be fulfilled exactly like that. He will descend from heaven with a shout. And his feet will stand upon the Mount of Olives before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives is going to split in two. And part of it is going to move toward the east and part of it toward the west. So some of it away from the city of Jerusalem, some of it toward the city of Jerusalem. And there shall be a very great valley. And maybe that is the valley of Jehoshaphat. Maybe that's this deep valley that we mentioned earlier. Maybe this is the Gai type of valley. Yo, the, uh, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil for thou art with me. That great valley where the armies of the earth will be gathered together and they're going to be destroyed as the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords returns to the earth. And you will flee to the valley of the mountains for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azel. Yea, ye shall flee like as you fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. The Lord my God shall come. Yehovah Elohe shall come and all the saints with him. Again, the church is returning with Jesus and coming back. And we are going to fight with him to reclaim and retake this earth. And it'll come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark. It will be one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night, but it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. And in that day, the living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea and half of them toward the hinder sea. In summer and in winter shall it be. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. And in that day shall there be one Lord, Echad, and, and his name, one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. King of all kings, Lord of all lords, and he's coming back to this earth to reclaim it. We have an example from the New Testament I want to consider as well. From 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. And there's numbers of places in, in your Bible where it talks about this return of Christ to the earth. Look how it's described in verse 8. In flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's coming back to rid this planet of all rebellion. And these that know not God, that obey not the gospel... These are they that shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord when he shall come to be glorified in his saints. So first we considered the purpose of Armageddon and that is to rid the earth of rebellion. Next we're going to talk about parables and patterns that picture Armageddon's timing and the separate, separation of the wicked from the righteous on the earth. We see it in the parables of Jesus recorded in Matthew, in Matthew 13. 
We see Jesus uh, uh, giving parables and then later on his disciples coming to him and saying, Lord, what, what do these parables mean? And the first example we want to deal with is the tares and the wheat. In Matthew 13, verse 36, then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came unto him saying, declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. And he answered and he said unto them, he that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. This will take place when Jesus returns at Armageddon and at the days that immediately follow when he sets up his kingdom. So shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. I studied uh, one time, I, I delved into this particular parable at one point. And when tares and wheat are planted together side by side, when the green shoots first come up, they look the same. It's difficult to tell the two apart. And as the stalk grows and before it begins to put on the head, the seed, uh, seed at the top, uh, they look very much the same. It's, uh, they're almost indistinguishable. And then as they begin to, to uh, bud out and seed and, and provide the head of seed, then it becomes, begins to become apparent the difference between the two. The tares have less seed by about half than what a head of wheat grain would have. Tares stand up straight like pride. They stand straight and tall, proud to be who they are. But the wheat, because of, of the, the weight of the, the grains and the seed, the head bows down almost as in reverence to God. So you have one that pictures pride and sin and rebellion and the other that pictures reverence an understanding of who God is and who we are. And in the end of the world, you can tell the difference. And Jesus said, I'm going to send forth my angels into all the world to gather all that offend out of this kingdom. Scary thought. Continuing in Matthew 13, we have another example. We're going to read verses 47 to 50. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was cast into the sea and it gathered of every kind. It's talking about all kinds of fish and, and whatnot, which when the net was full, they drew it to the shore and they sat down and they gathered the good into vessels, but they cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. Here we have the same statement, the exact same statement. The angel shall come forth and sever the wicked. Good fish, bad fish. Righteous fish, unrighteous, rebellious fish. So sever the wicked from the just or the wicked from the righteous. They're going to be divided. And cast them into the furnace of fire. There should be wailing and gnashing of teeth. All this will take place. In Matthew 25, 
We're going to read a few verses about the same thing, but there are other examples as you read through. In Matthew 25, you have a parable of 10 virgins. Five were wise, five were foolish. Five got to go into the kingdom. Five were excluded from the kingdom. And in Matthew 25, we've got when Jesus returns to the earth and he sets up his kingdom and he sets up his rule and reign, you have, you have at that point in time the separation of the sheep and the goats. Let's pick up Matthew 25, verse 31. And when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he'll set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on the right, the sheep. And by the way, his sheep know his voice. They hear him and they know him. And he'll, the king will say to them on the right, come you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. This is the millennial reign of Christ. Then shall he say to them on the left, depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. These shall go away, verse 46 says, into everlasting punishment, but the righteous unto life eternal. It's a scary thought. Armageddon will begin the division of the good from the evil. The righteous will return with Jesus to the earth and we will fight with him at the return in this great skirmish or campaign called Armageddon. Good fish, bad fish, tares, wheat, sheep, goats. There's a division coming. So first, we talked about the purpose of Armageddon. Second, we talked about parables and patterns of Armageddon. And now third, the participants at Armageddon. All of the following are involved in this great campaign. We have the church who's returning with Christ to the earth. We have Israel who is struggling just to stay alive down on this planet under the control of the Antichrist. During the last three and a half years, they flee in terror and flee for their life. And they go to a place, likely they go to a place down in the desert of Jordan. It's called Basra, uh, also known as Petra, perhaps. And they flee there and there they're nourished and protected by God, Revelation 12 tells us. Protected by God and nourished for three and a half years, 1,260 days. So we have the church returning with Christ. We got Israel on the earth. And then we have the world system. And the world system will all come to an end and be replaced by the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. The church will live forever. We have been given eternal bodies at the rapture of the church when we return to heaven with the Lord. Back to Armageddon, we are told in the book of Joel, and we're going to read a number of verses from Joel chapter 3. This is the actual battle site and the battle time. Behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all nations. This is a theme. It's a repeating theme. I will gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. We know this as the Kidron Valley, and it continues from that point on. And I'm going to plead with them there. I'm going to plead with them over my people, Israel, my heritage, Israel, 
whom they have scattered among the nations, and they parted my land. God is coming and he's going to reason with people. It'll be a righteous reasoning. And they will falter and fail. And they will be destroyed. Skipping down to verse 9. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Prepare for war. It's coming. Let the weak say, I'm strong. Assemble yourselves and come. All the heathen, gather yourselves together around about. There cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put in the sickle. Remember the verbiage from the book of Revelation, chapter 14 and chapter 19. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full. The vats overflow. Their wickedness is great. Multitudes multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision the sun and the moon shall be darkened and the stars shall withdraw their shining the Lord shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem the heavens and the earth shall shake but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel Egypt shall be a desolation and Edom shall be a desolate wilderness for their violence against the children of Israel because they have shed innocent blood in their their land. Nations are going to be judged by how and what they do to God's chosen people, Israel. Nations will be judged and they will be dispatched to a devil's hell and righteousness will enter into the kingdom prepared for them and righteous will begin to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years we call that period the millennium it's described in our Bibles in Revelation chapter 20 Consider a timeline. Here's a timeline. We're here. It's October of this year, 2021. At some point on the horizon, Jesus is going to come for his church. And those who are ready, those who are looking for his coming, will hear the sound of the trumpet and the voice of the archangel, and we will respond The dead in Christ, Thessalonians tells us, will rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet them in the clouds. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. There will be people who will not be ready and people who have rejected God who will be lost. Strong delusion will come so that they will believe a lie. Following the rapture of the church, a dark figure will assume the position of leadership in the world. The Bible calls him by many names, some 17 to 20 different names. You know him as the Antichrist, and he will rise up. He will make a seven-year treaty with Israel, and that treaty will allow them to build their temple. And they'll build their temple on Temple Mount, and they will... They will get the temple built and they will reinstitute mosaic sacrifices because they do not believe that Jesus is their Messiah. Their eyes have been temporarily blinded to allow you and I as the church to be grafted in to the root of Jesse, to be grafted in to the seed of Abraham, children of almighty God. 
During that seven-year period, this man will allow Israel to do their thing. He will allow them to begin their worship. But then he'll turn on them in the middle of the week and he will declare, I am your God. And he will set his throne in Jerusalem in the temple of God. And as he sets his throne in Jerusalem in the temple of God, he'll begin to rule the world with the purpose of destruction, destroying them. Satan will, will lead this whole entourage. Then as the last half of the tribulation closes and begins winding down, coming to an end, he gathers the armies of the earth together to fight against the return of Christ to the earth. During that time, multitudes, multitudes will pay an eternal price. They've taken the mark of the beast or his name or his number and they are eternally lost. Others who refuse to live for God, others who refuse Jesus as Lord will be rejected and they too will be lost. We conclude with this thought from Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 30 says, for we know him that has said, vengeance belongs to me. I will recompense. I will repay, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of of the living God. Let's pray. Lord, there are people who have heard this message who continue to reject you. There are people, Lord, and we pray for them in Jesus' name that they would hear that still, small voice, hear the voice of God. You said, Lord, my sheep know my voice they hear me speak to your people I pray keep us close to your riven side I pray help us to walk in faith help us to walk in hope help us to walk in love help us Lord to, to walk in forgiveness to love one another Help us to be all the things that the world will not be and will not have in these days that are immediately ahead. Protect your people. Take us up in the rapture. Forgive us of our sins as we draw nigh to you. God bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Shalom in the name of Jesus. God bless his church. Amen.